the weather and the parking. Um, we really appreciate you coming. Just gonna, after the program, we're gonna have um, a reception back in the room. We'll have sales again. We'll have more raffle tickets for sale. So if you didn't get a chance to buy your raffle tickets, we've got some great prizes. Um, tonight's program morphed over the last year because he researched and discovered more and more and he just wanted to incorporate all of those pieces into his journey um, for this program. So um, I'll let him talk about that journey and wrap up there. Uh, good evening and um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Rhett Butler. I own a company called ER Butler and Company. That company um, started in Attleboro. It's a long family history, but it's interesting for me and I like to research it. Um, I'd like to thank the First Congregational Church for having us. Um, I'd like to thank the Attleboro Historic Preservation Society. Um, they've been unwavering in their support for what I'm trying to do here. And to Rachel and Brian and Jerry in particular for their encouragement. And in some cases, it's every day I'm here, I see Jerry and he's like, it's great, let's keep doing this. Um, and thank you all for attending. I'm, um, I typically talk very fast, so if I am going too fast, just raise your hand and say slow down. Um, if you want me to um, stop, louder? Okay, sorry. Um, I'll just talk louder. Uh, if you want me to stop on something and explain anything or go back to something, just let me know. All right? And we're going to cover a lot of material. So I'm looking at um, this history in a three-dimensional way. Uh, you have time, which is the chronology, and we're going to basically do everything chrono chronologically. You have a Robinson family history, which is the family that started the company that I'm running today. And then you have the First Congregational Church, which is where we are. Um, how our company got here was we were in Boston. And I did a map of all the employees and all the suppliers that we use, or not all of them, but the important ones. And I saw that we had an opportunity to move south out of Boston. Boston was getting too expensive. Um, I had employees that were driving you know, ridiculous hours and miles to get to work. And I discovered that really, we wanted to be further south and then I also had my secret reason, which is that I wanted to be in Robinsonville because that's where the Robinsons came from. So that's the reason why we're in Attleboro. Um, I justified it with tons of like analysis for the miles that people would save or not save. Um, and it's sort of like my way of mapping. This is an overview of the history of the company. And we come from a long line of a lot of different companies working mostly out of Boston. But if you travel through all of the different trails, you get into the Robinsons here, and then you get into the early Robinson family history, which is where everything really started. Um, this early history involves uh, George Robinson Sr. He's coming from England in 1640. He's born in 1626, and he's dying in 1699 here in Attleboro. But he's coming in as the Great Migration in the uh, 1640s. Um, he has a son. I mean, he has many children, but I'm going to go through the lineage that's important for us. He has a son, George Robinson Jr. Um, George Robinson Jr. has Noah Robinson. Noah Robinson has Enoch Robinson. And from Enoch Robinson, we get to George Whitfield Robinson. And that's kind of where I end my story for now. Um, because George then has three very important sons for me. Enoch, again, who's named after his grandfather. George Washington, who's named after George Washington, of course. Um, and Ezra Blake Robinson. All of them are machinists. All of them are foundry men. All of them are inventing and patenting. Um, and they're all mechanics. Um, <clears throat> this is a small a shout out to the Attleboro Public Library. To Carrie in particular, thank you for allowing me to borrow these three books. Um, they are packed with a lot of information, and unfortunately, they're very rare, so hopefully we'll get a chance to digitize these and make them more available. But they talk about Attleboro history in a really great way. 
Um, all right, so everybody knows this scene, right? 1620, the Mayflower gets to Plymouth Colony and um, we start to take over the land of the Indians. Um, here, we, here they are arriving and the thing to understand is that 1620 wasn't the first arrival of the English. You have Jamestown in like uh, 1607, I think. Um, and you have other areas that we started to colonize, but it is the first place in New England and that's meaningful for us. Um, it's also one of the more permanent lasting uh, settlements. And the reason why I think we find it so endearing is that they came here for religious reasons to get away from the, the, the UK. And Jamestown, for example, was more about uh, merchants trying to figure out how to profit off of coming to the American colony. Okay, so George Robinson Sr., um, again, he's coming from England, he is arriving in Plymouth Colony, he is in, I can't find him on a ship, but I think he's coming with Samuel Newman, uh, that would have been on the, the James, and that would have been coming in around 1637-38, um, and they are moving, um, to Weymouth, and from Weymouth, they're coming towards Attleboro. So this is the earliest map specifically of New England, and it's, what was that? <laughs> and uh, it's coming out of a book that was printed in England, and it's um, 1634, and then it's repeated again in 1639. This is a map uh, produced by a Belgian firm, um, so all of the names of New England are going to be Belgian names. Um, the thing I found very uh, funny about this particular map is that when you look at where Attleboro is going to be, it's just a couple of rabbits. <laughs> Samuel uh, Newman was an uh, educated Oxford uh, reverend, and he uh, was working on what is known as the concordance mm -hmm. to the Bible. And basically what he's doing is he's taking every single word in the Bible and alphabetizing it so that you can look up where it exists in the Bible and find it if you're doing research. So it's an academic thing, but this book that he put together lasted almost 300 years in its republication. Um, so it's widely used within uh, the religious communities. Um, so my theory is that George Sr. is coming with Sam Newman to Weymouth, and then from Weymouth, they get a group of uh, uh, people together that want to leave Weymouth and form a plantation uh, called Seekonk, and they're called the Seekonk Plantors. Um, so they have their first meeting October 24th, 1643. And they, in that meeting, decide that by April 20th, of the following year, they're going to move to Seekonk. And between the October meeting and the April 20th deadline, they all had to go there and they had their land forming what they call the Ring of Green. And each person was responsible for fencing their portion of the Ring of the Green. And the reason for that is that they had to protect their animals. Um, particularly at night, and they're in the middle of the woods, and there's like all kinds of things out there at night that want to eat their animals. So they had this responsibility. I find it difficult to believe that they wanted to do this over the course of the winter months, and living basically in like, I don't even know what, but uh, they must have froze while they were building this fence to be preparing themselves for the spring, and that's what they did. If you did not show up, or if you didn't fence your land, then you were removed and they, your land was then given to someone else. So it was approximately 60 people that left Weymouth and traveled to Seekonk in 1644. Um, so you're moving this distance here. Seekonk is from 1644 to 1645. And the reason for that is they went through a name change to Rehoboth. But in, in the books that Carrie 
grace, gracefully gave me to borrow and read through, I found this one reference, which is, I've never found it before, but George Robinson Sr. is given land in, in July of 1644. He's not listed as one of the original proprietors, but he is given the land within three months of their arrival to Seekonk. This is a map from the same group of books, which is the Earhart three-volume set, um, showing the original Ring of Green. Uh, in particular, I just want you to notice what I've put in red. There's Edward Sale's lot, and then there is Ralph Shepard's lot. Ralph Shepard is the lot that was given to uh, George Sr. because Ralph obviously either didn't show up or he didn't fence it in. So in June 4th, 1645, that's when the Plymouth General Court approved that the name Seekonk could be changed to Rehoboth. Rehoboth is a term out of the Bible, which is, at last the Lord has made room for us and we will be fruitful in the land, and that's coming from Samuel Newman. The thing to understand is Attleboro is Seekonk to Rehoboth, to the North Purchase, to becoming Attleboro. So this is the very beginning of where we are today. The Rehoboth Purchase, as it's known, is lasting from 1645 to 1661. And the Earhart collection, and I should have mentioned this when it was up on the screen, is very purposefully divided into pre seekonk and Rehoboth, and then the Rehoboth Purchase, and then the North Purchase, and then he goes on to subdivide that into like the Revolutionary War and the Continental Congress, and then between the Continental Congress and the beginning of the United States till 1812. 1812 is when we finally stop having a war with England. George Sr is marrying in 1651 the daughter of one of his neighbors in the Ring of the Green. They have George Robinson Jr. in 1656. And between 1661 and 1689, they purchased the land from the Indians north of Rehoboth, which is called the North Purchase but they argued about whether they could buy the land from the Indians and whether the general court of the Massachusetts Bay Colony or the general court of the Plymouth Colony would agree with them. It took you know, approximately 28 years for them to figure out whether that was gonna be okay. Um, between 89 and 90, it was ratified um, by Bradford, uh, Major Bradford, out of uh, the Plymouth Colony and that's when the North Purchase was legitimized. In red, that is the North Purchase. So it's what is today Attleboro and Cumberland, Rhode Island. From researching, you see that George Robinson here is listed as an original from 1661 purchase of the North Purchase. And a couple of other names to note is Samuel Newman, who is the Reverend at Rehoboth. Uh, John Woodcock, if you'll remember, is the person that is creating the Woodcock Garrison in North Attleboro. And I also threw in John Daggett because he's the grandfather of the Daggett that wrote the sketch to the history of Attleboro. Um, in the, another iteration of the divisions of the land of North uh, Purchase, um, there is a lot of conversations about who gets what division, who showed up, who didn't, who's actually like providing lumber for like building of the meeting houses and things like that. But they specifically call out George Robinson in this very short list of people that were inhabiting the North, the North uh, Purchase. And again, in the ratification period of 1668 to 1669, we see that George Robinson is included in that group, as is John Woodcock, as is John Daggett. There's a lot of other names that I could go down rabbit holes, but I'm just leaving these three people for us to like focus on. In this particular section of the same pages, we see that uh, John Woodcock and his sons build the first settlement in 1669. So that is the first building in what will become Attleboro. This is a 1670 map. Um, 
it shows Seekonk here, it shows Rehoboth, and it shows nothing in the northern part. Uh, the reason why I wanted you to look at that ring of green at Edward Sales' property is that now you have George Robinson and you have John Daggett right next to each other, and they're at one of the main gates that goes down to the docks where they can load ships to get out into the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Um, many of these plantors would have a home lot at the ring of the green, and the reason for that is because they all had to come for church and the church or the meeting house was at the center of the Ring of the Green. They had to travel a great distance to get to that church from the North Purchase, particularly in wintertime, particularly for the children. So a lot of them would maintain a house at the Ring of Green, but then during the week they'd be working up in the North Purchase to gather lumber or to like, you know, grow their crops or whatever else that, that they needed to do. The Ring of the Green is located where a present-day Rumford or East Providence is. Highway 1, which is the Boston Post Road or the Old Post Road, that originates at the Ring of the Green and it comes right through and was the street that is right in front of this church. This is another early map from 1675. 1675 was a particularly difficult year for the people in Rehoboth. They're still not making the map, but what's interesting about this map is that it's a big mix of Indian and settler names and places. And it's also very telling what begins to happen in 1675 because that is the beginning of King Philip's War. So that war remains the bloodiest uh, by percentage war that this country has ever seen. Uh, but it was by no means equal to what the Indians lost during that war. But 10% of the white settlers, male, were lost during that war. And, uh, you know, I mean, over time, millions of Indians lost their lives. George Robinson, as you can see, was one of the people who served in King Philip, the Phillips War, uh, King Philip's War. I took this list and I identified every person that was um, under Major Bradford. And I... I'm making some assumptions that it's the younger men that are fighting, not the older men. And then there were the people that actually gave money, which is another George Robinson. So my assumption is George Robinson Sr. was helping to pay for the war, and George Robinson Jr. was actually fighting in the war. In, at the, in 1676, the Indians managed to burn down the entire ring of green, so everything was lost. I think that that had a lot to do with more people moving into the North Purchase, which is Attleboro today. This is a 1677 map, which is after the King Philip Wars, and you can see that uh, you have Seekonk here, you have Providence across the river, you have Mount Hope, which is where King Philip used to be, and you see the beginning of uh, Rhode Island, Newport, etc. This is a list of the inhabitants of the North Purchase. And here you have George Robinson Sr., Samuel Robinson, William Robinson, Benjamin Robinson. These are all his sons, right? George Robinson Jr. So they're a big component of the people that are in the North Purchase. Daggett, in his book, talks about the Robinson family and mentions that there are six brothers of this name that came from Rehoboth previous to 1730. They were descendants of George Robinson of that town whose name may be found on the list of proprietors of the Rehoboth North Purchase. If you really dig through the literature, you'll see John Woodcock, you'll see George Robinson, you'll see a couple of other Woodcocks. These are the early, early, early settlers of the North Purchase. These are the six brothers that he is mentioning, Daggett. Nathaniel died in infancy, so really there was only five brothers. Uh, so I'm not really sure how they get six, but these are the five that we are going to follow. And then George Jr. in particular is the lineage that I follow to get to where I am today. 1692 is one of the cutoff periods for Earhart. And the reason why it's the cutoff is it's also the end of Plymouth Colony. Uh, the colony is absorbed into the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, and uh, 
so, that, so we're at 1692, a very important date to understand. Attleboro, there is a petition coming from Attleboro that they want to form a town. This is in 1694. The main signer of this petition is, once again, John Woodcock. The main reason why they think that they should have a town, and it's right there, first and principally for the honor of God. So they want to build a meeting house. They want to have their place of religion. And they don't want to have to walk the, the distance to get to the Ring of the Green. Within a couple of days, they're granted their petition and they're in, um, incorporated as the town of Attleboro. So that's why you always see that date on the seal of Attleboro. Within a year, well, I should say this. In order to be a town back in Plymouth Colony, you had to have a reverend and you had to have a meeting house. That was the rule. So immediately they start to work on a meeting house. And um, six men agreed to pay for this meeting house. You have John Woodcock as one of them, and you have George Robinson as another. So again, it's my research for the Robinson family, so I'm very focused on Robinson, but there's also a lot of great information about a lot of other people as you go through this mapping research. This is the 1702 map, and again, you have Seekonk, and you've got Providence, and you've got Plymouth, of course, up here, and then you've got Boston up there, but the thing I found very interesting about this map is rather than saying it's Attleboro, they say it's Woodcock. So Woodcock's garrison is such an important building on the path from Providence to Boston that every single person that was in any confrontation or war was stopping there. They would, they would get refreshments, they would get nourishment, they would sometimes have a place to stay, um, or they would camp around this, this particular building because it was a fortified house where you could protect yourself since the very beginning, 1669 is when he starts this. Uh, a couple of years later, he gets permission to run it as a tavern, provided that there's no unruliness. In uh, 1702, Noah is born. By the way, these are always continuing to be blacksmiths or wheelwrights or um, the making of metal. The family was always making metal. Um, George Sr., he's coming over, and he's a wheelwright. A wheelwright is a guy that's making the metal parts for wooden wheels. Um, I like to think of that guy in today's world as a guy who's like working for NASA building satellites. Because to make iron in that era, you're dredging ponds, you're scraping the bottom, you're like melting this iron ore into ingots, and then you're hammering that stuff out, and then you got to make it into strips, you got to make it into spokes, and you got to assemble that. Not an easy thing to do in the 1600s. This is the 1711 map. It's the earliest map I have found that shows Attleboro as a town. It's on the post road, right? So you've got Rehoboth down here going into Providence. That's the only road in this section of the country. And that's the, the meeting house in Attleboro, and that's this building. I mean, this is the third iteration of this building, but that's what they're describing, is they're describing the first congregational church. Um, and that's 1711. But it could be that the map is a little bit not dated correctly, or it could be that the first congregational church uh, isn't really timed correctly. Um, but it was incorporated in 1712, but I'm sure it existed before 1712. Because remember that we had the five guys that are giving money in 1696 to pay for a meeting house. So that's, you know, what, 16 years earlier than, than the incorporation. So 1712 is, the, is what they say the church is founded at because it's um, when, I, when their first, uh, what was it, uh, Small, Minister Small was uh, brought in. Um, so you had to meet the two the two criteria. One is you had to have a minister, and one is you had to have a meeting house. So perhaps the meeting house was built first, and then they had to search for the minister. 
Noah Robinson marries the daughter of John Daggett, uh, Patience. And again, John Daggett is the grandfather to the person who wrote the sketch of the history of Attleboro. They have Enoch Robinson in 1736. Enoch Robinson is also a blacksmith, but he's also making cannons. And that means he has to have a foundry. And that means you have to have a lot of metallurgical uh, experience to do that. Um, he later becomes the deacon of this church. This is coming out of the Robinson Scrolls. Uh, the Robinson family was very much into their genealogy. Uh, they wrote tons of information about their family. Um, some of it is correct, some of it's incorrect, but it was enough to get me started. And what we'll find is that we have Enoch Robinson, Comfort Robinson, and Jabez Ellis uh, as part of this uh, information that's coming from the Robinson Scrolls, those three uh, were in Captain Ellis's company that responded to the Lexington and Concord alarm on April 19th, 1775. So it's really good information to have things like this because eventually we're going to need it to piece together those people that signed that Solemn League and Covenant. These are the sons. George W. is the one that I'm going to concentrate on, but as a town, you're probably very familiar with Obed and Otis Robinson because they're the ones that started the button manufacturing, which then led into the jewelry manufacturing. They're the ones that hired the Frenchman who came in and is like the unknown person who theoretically started the jewelry, but it was the Robinsons that brought him in. It was the Robinsons that created the factories. It was the Robinsons that made the products that were the beginning of the industrialization of Attleboro. Between 1740, 1754 and 1763, there were the French and Indian Wars. Um, I didn't feel like there was much of a connection, but I just wanted to put that in your heads as like yet another war that we're having here in New England. Here's another map from 1760. Once again, you're seeing the old post road, you're seeing Attleboro, you're seeing the first congregational church, you're seeing the same thing in Rentham, and you're seeing the same thing in Rehoboth. So George Whitfield Robinson, he is a prolific inventor. He has 14 patents to his name. He's working in Attleboro, he's working in, he's getting his patents filed in Providence. Um, he's working with his brothers, Obed and Otis, to develop equipment and machinery for making the buttons and then eventually for also making jewelry. The machines are designed for um, stamping and pressing and crimping so that they can essentially make these buttons. And the reason why their business exploded is because they started making these things called gilt buttons. And gilt buttons are the decorative buttons on military and firemen and police jackets and of course, we're constantly at war, so they're constantly making buttons, and their business is exploding. And that brings me to Marion, because I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find an 1832 map, and I find one in the fire barn, and it's glued to a board, and the board is leaching tannins, and it's bubbling, and I'm looking at this map going like, wow. Uh, this is going to take me like a year to clean up in a computer. Um, and I'm talking to, I forget who, but Marion's like, oh, I have one of those 1832 maps. You should come on over. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. So I go over to her house. Oh, well, the first thing she told me was, if you're coming to my house, you need two hours because I like to talk. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm going to give it two hours. I go over to her house and I see the map and it's perfect and it, it's going to cut out months of like you know graphic design work and I get the full two-hour tour thank you and during that tour I see this document on the wall and I see names on it that I'm recognizing because I'm also working on researching and it was Elijah May was the first one I saw and then John Daggett was the second one I saw and I was just like wow that, that this is kind of cool because like you know, it's like we, the subscribers of the town of Line, fill it in, Attleboro. <clears throat> um, we're, you know, we're going to like argue with the king of England and we're not going to do these things. And I couldn't read the whole thing because it's all ye early English stuff, whatever. But 
I, I saw enough of it to like get it stuck in my head. And I'm driving down to New York and I'm like, what did I just see? Like it's dated 1774. That's before our Declaration of Independence, but it read like a Declaration of Independence. So I Google, hey, where, where do, are, these, are there other forms of the Declaration of Independence? And of course, you know, it didn't take me long, but I found the guy that owned the original. And the story I got from Marion was that a young man was cleaning out his mother's attic, found this document, brought it to Marion, wanted $500 for it. Well, the Historic Commission of Attleboro doesn't have any money because Attleboro, Attleboro doesn't give them any, which they should. Um, and I think that's something we should all think about because they couldn't buy a $500 document from 1774 because they had no money. And so I think we need to collectively send a really clear message that the commission needs money. Um, anyway, that sold on eBay for $12,500. And the person, Sam Foreman, that gave the last year's lecture, he was the one that bought it. And his first question to me was like, what do you know about this document? And I'm like, well, I told him the story about how it came out of the attic. And he was like, Whew, I just assumed it was stolen. Because there's only five known copies of this document. Four of them are institutional hands. And he's the only one that privately owns this document. So I say, hey, I'd like to get a scan of this document. And then he's like, why? And I said, well, because I'd like to reprint it for the Attleboro Preservation Society, Historic Preservation Society. And he is silent for like a full minute. And he's like, OK. I would have said no. But I like your reason. You know, and let's do it. So he had it restored at the American Antiquarian Society. I happen to know the guy that's the president there. I called Bill and I'm like, hey, you know, you guys restored this document. Did you take a scan of it? And they're like, no, we don't scan anything that's not ours. So I said, well, can you scan this? And he said, no, we don't scan anything that's not ours. We don't want the risk. But you can go to this conservational scanning company in this other section of Massachusetts. So. Sam wasn't about to let this document out of his hands. And I had to talk this company into like an appointment to get something scanned while he sat there and waited for it. Because his, in his estimation, that document's worth way north of a quarter of a million dollars. And probably priceless. Because he's the one that paid 12000 for it? He paid 12000 for it, yeah. 12500 <laughs> um, So that was a, an amazing moment and a big turning point for me and my involvement in Attleboro and, and my interest in like all these people that signed this document and you know a lot of these people are coming from this meeting house, this church, like South Attleboro, the section that I'm in. Um, so here we are at the 1774 Solemn League and Covenant. Um, we went through a lot of different graphic tricks to try and like get this document to look really good because it was crooked, it was printed crooked, um, there was torn off sections, there's like missing signers, um, but there's enough material to work with. I mean, Sam's estimation is that there were like, uh, you know, over a hundred signers, but there's only 66 remaining. And so we got to work with what we have, right? This is the upper portion of the document. This is the lower portion of the document. There's two sections of signatures. You can see how it's completely torn off right around here where there's a lot of missing information. This is what I saw when I was at Marion's. I saw John Daggett right there and I saw Elijah May. And May Street is named after Elijah May. Um, you get a lot of names in here where there are street names all over Attleboro named after these exact people. Almost all of these people are fighting in the Revolutionary War. Many of them are captains. Many of them are lieutenants. Um, it's, it's, as you go through the war history, they're all over the place. Um, Joseph Capron, Jr., um, that's the park that's downtown, that's the guy that is the surveyor that's actually like, or his son is the surveyor. 
um, <clears throat> with the same name. And uh, it's over and over and over that I'm seeing these names as I'm going through to try and document who these signers are. Um, the thing that I got the most excited about, of course, was Captain Javis Ellis, okay? He's the one that led the Robinsons on the Lexington and Concord Battle Day. And then you've got Comfort Robinson that was clearly in that same document. And then you've got another little Robinson to the right, but the first name is torn off. So I have to take a really good educated guess about who that Robinson is. And I think that's Enoch Robinson because they're two brothers that are similar in age and they would have been of the age to fight and they would have been ready to go. And these guys were signing this, getting ready to go. We're 74, the war starts in 75, and then 76, we all know. So I start picking away at it and I'm going to all the cemeteries to find where these guys are buried. I'm looking up all the different records and I'm trying to get ready to give you guys a lecture on the signers of this document, but there are a lot of signers and there's a lot of information and I'm picking at it, but I probably have like, I don't know, a couple thousand hours into trying to figure out who exactly these guys are. And I've got file after file after file of like trying to figure that out. And maybe at some point I'll be able to produce a document about who these people are and some of it's going to be correct and some of it's going to be incorrect and some of it's going to be my best guess. But it's an amazing story when you really start digging into like who these people are, where they're coming from, what building they're signing this document in, and this building itself. Um, each name um, has a very close high-res image of the signature. Um, it took me months to figure out what exactly their names were. Um, the first is Sam's guess at what the name is. The second one is when I finally figured out that it's Atwell, like, because I'm using local information, local cemeteries, uh, local genealogy uh, to find what could this name possibly be. Um, and then we get to last year where we had Sam come down and give us a lecture about the Solemn League and Covenant. I think he was so happy with the research and so happy with the reprint and so happy that he got the credit for the reprint that he literally called me up and said, hey, you know, I'd like to come and give a lecture. Do you think people would want to hear a lecture on why this document is so important? And I was like, yeah, like, come on down. And so he did. And we got this document, which is the front page of the Sun Chronicle, which I thought was really cool. You know, we've got our, 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 uh, our three patriots here. Um, and for me, personally speaking, um, I, I was very satisfied that we had got to the point where we actually got the first page of the paper. We had this beautiful lecture. We've got this beautiful reprint. And we can use it as a tool for investigating, you know, what our past was and, you know, allow us to, to really get that story back to where it needs to be because it's kind of like broken into a thousand pieces at this moment. Um, this is a 75 map. Um, you can see the troops marching on Post Road uh, heading up to Bunker Hill, I think, in this particular map. And you're starting to see other roads that are connecting to the Post Road. But let's not forget that the Post Road was the original road. It's the reason why it's called One. Right? So it's going from Boston all the way to New York and then south, but that's Highway 1. That's the only highway or the only road that we really had that connected all of these different towns. Um, this is a map that they produced in uh, 1775 called the 30 Miles Round Boston map. Um, I find it very interesting for uh, one particular reason. Um, it cut off Attleboro perfectly, like we're not on the map. And it also says memorable occurrences. And one of those occurrences is the 1774 Solemn League and Covenant. This is a French map for uh, the French army as they're coming through to assist Washington. And you can see that we have Rehoboth, we have Attleboro. It's the Old Post Road. We're right off the Seven Mile River. So you know it is this building here that they're talking about. Or I should say the first of this building. And in 1791, 
Brother Enoch Robinson is chosen the deacon of this First Congregational Church. The 1795 plan of the town of Attleboro, thanks to Jerry, who brought it to my attention, because I have always looked at this map as like a very boring map. I didn't really see it, I didn't really understand it. In the beginning, the two of us actually thought that this was Hatch's Tavern, or the Woodcock Garrison House. I found the people that actually were in charge of making that map in Daggett's book. So you have Joel Reed and Jacob Ide and Ebenezer Daggett. They are the ones that actually surveyed and made that map. Jacob Ide is signing it as a selectman. Jacob Ide is one of the signers of the Solemn League and Covenant. Jacob Ide is the town clerk that actually wrote the letter from Attleboro to the Committee of Correspondence in Boston. And he's using words like, you know, justly entitled, beat down the stronghold, break the jaws of the Gallic lion. We're talking about England and how they're being abused and how they have rights and like they need to have these rights exercised. But the thing that I found the most interesting is that he goes, and in the late war that hath been upon us, have joined our British brethren warring and fighting through the seas of blood until we subdued all the Canadian province to the crown of our sovereign Lord George III. Well, that's the French and Indian Wars. So we participated in that, and there's our evidence. Because he's like complaining that we sacrificed, and you're like basically now, you know, conjugating us, enslaving us, and ruining us. Like, we want out of this. So these are very strong, powerful words going to the Committee of Correspondence, which is what Sam Foreman was telling us about. So there it is, right? And he ends with saying, is a most barbarous, unjust, unconstitutional affair, and as cruel as the ostrich. I don't personally understand what he means by the ostrich, but I'm sure it has something to do with the ruling parties in England. You want to follow Ide as another character, then you go into the Ide family genealogy, and you can follow all of that. And that's what's existing for every single one of these signers. A lot of work. In the 1795 map, that's the structure. There's only four structures on this map. That's the structure that we thought was the Woodcock Garrison House or the Hatches Inn or Hatches Hotel. Um, if you really look at where the river is and what side of the river it's on, you start to realize in your mapping that it's not Hatches Hotel, it's the Baptist Meeting House or the First Baptist Church. And then it's this back and forth with the maps that allows you to start to investigate what is what and where were things and who had what and why is this map even existing. So I went through the entire thing and kind of nailed most of it. And then I got to this last structure at the bottom and I'm thinking, well, it has to be a meeting house. It has to be a church, but there's no evidence on any other map and there's nothing there today. And then uh, I start just reading all the books again, and thankfully a lot of them are scanned, so it's all OCR, so I can like actually just do search terms throughout these documents now. And sure enough, in Daggett's book, he talks about the South Baptist Church. And I have to say that thankfully because of the maps that I've been working with, and in reading what Daggett had to say, um, he specifically says here that the meeting house was taken down about 1810. It stood on the south side of the road leading from what was known 20 years later as the late Thomas Cooper's place to that of Captain Joseph Tiffany. I'm like, oh, okay, well, let's go look at one of our maps. There's Joseph Tiffany on Tiffany Street today. So now we know where the South Baptist Church used to be, and that aligns perfectly with the 1795 map. So here we are. Um, Tiffany, by the way, uh, his son Ebenezer was the father of Charles. Charles is the Tiffany that went to New York and formed the Tiffany that we all know today. So that's also kind of cool, but nothing to do with what we're talking about. Um, but that allowed me to complete my notations on the 1795 plan of Attleboro 
and then we went ahead and reprinted it for tonight's lecture. So it's available in the back. And I'm a map salesperson, so feel free. Um, 1795 is also the year that this church incorporates. Um, uh, you have 16 signers from the Solemn League and Covenant that are signing their name to the incorporation for this church. You've got six families of Robinsons that are signing this incorporation for this church. And now I'm going to move on to <clears throat> another little story. This is the original patent for the button making machine that is by George Whitfield Robinson in 1804. Um, it is at the Beinecke Library. It's a very rare document. It's signed by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. It's really cool that this exists. Um, but this is the beginning of the story of the manufacturing of buttons in Attleboro. Uh, they don't really get too uh, large until about 1812. I think that has a lot to do with the war that's going on. Um, but they're already building equipment and, and machines to make buttons uh, in Attleboro. That is the Robinson button manufacturing. We see that on the 1832 map. That is in uh, Attleboro Falls. There's a street right there called Robinson Avenue, I think. And that area eventually becomes known as Robinsonville. Uh, they had that much influence um, on the Attleboroughs. So in talking to Revlin Kelly about some back and forth research, she's telling me about like, oh yeah, 1816 to 28, we, we had lots of troubles in Old Town with the church. And sure enough, I got from Rachel this document because she is uh, the historian for the Universalist uh, Church. And in their storage, they have these documents. And she's like, oh, you might be interested in this document. And yeah, sure enough, it's like the, you know, the petition to leave the Congregational Church and to form the Universalist Church because they're having all these disagreements. And that's what I've been finding throughout the entire history of the colony is that it's nothing but religious uh, issues and uh, issues between the way that you pray and the way that you're publicly praying or privately praying. Everybody had an opinion about how that was going to work. Um, but for me personally, I got all of these Robinsons signing this document. So all the Robinsons are leaving this meeting house to form their own meeting house. And I don't know why, but I'm going to dig down that rabbit hole when I get a chance. The grant to it, uh, incorporate the first universal society in Attleboro was in 1818. And here you can see on the 32 map that you have the first congregational is right here and the universal is right next to it, you know, or, you know 200 feet down the street. Um, I forget exactly how many rods they said the distance was, but a rod, which will come up later, is uh, equal to 16 and a half feet. So George Whitfield Robinson goes on to invent what's known as a lightning rod insulator in 1825. And I found this newspaper clipping and I just thought, oh, I would really love to have one of these. Oh, you do? I, I really, really would love to see that. <laughs> but so um, I wrote to the two presidents of the two major insulator collector clubs. And I said, hey, I found this uh, article and this image of a patent model. Um, you know, do you guys know of anybody that might have one of these? And the guy wrote me back and said, wow, that's 20 years earlier than anything we ever knew about. And um, it, your chances of finding one now with our 40,000 membership is zero. So anyway, I finally found a guy that has one. It takes me a year and a half to get him to send it to me. I had to insure it for $10,000. He's a professor in Illinois, but you know, I, I do tend to like track stuff down. And I got it, and I photographed it, and I sent it back to him. But I'm showing you this more because if anyone here knows of one, Bob, <laughs> I'd really like to get one because I had to send this one back. Um, but it says B&R. So that's Brown and Robinson, patent, and it's really cool that it's made here in Attleboro. 
And for me, it's actually the very, very beginning of the glass industry. They're casting these, but Attleboro is the beginning of the press glass story, which I'm not going to get into tonight because it's way too deep, but it's a very beautiful story and it starts right here. So in 1828, the First Congregational Church builds their third building, and the reason was because their second building was getting to the point where it was dangerous and the, um, uh, the courts were telling the church that they had to shut the, the, the structure down and not use it because it was too dangerous. Um, that was the American Building, uh, American Historical Building uh, Survey. Uh, Historic American Building Survey, sorry, HABS, I should know that by heart. Um, they went around during the 30s and they documented everything during the Great Depression because they had to give people work and they had all these architects and artists and all these other people that they went around and said, hey, draw up all these historic buildings, document it, photograph it. And so that's what they did. And, you know, this is all coming from the Library of Congress. Um, but what I really like about this image is that, hey, there's one of those lightning rod insulators on the outside of this building. <laughs> It's 1828, George Robinson, George Whitfield Robinson had just invented it three years earlier, so it's gonna be on this building. So maybe you guys have one in the basement. <laughs> uh, and then here's another angle and another view. Um, so the other thing that this church has is a lock and a key, and it's in that display case back there, and that's also George Whitfield Robinson's patent of 1818, and George Whitfield Robinson is donating that lock for the front doors because guess what, his dad is a deacon, so why not, right? And that's the reason why I first came to this church is I came to this church to see the hardware on the front doors and it wasn't there, and I'm leaving, and the guy's like, well, did you find what you wanted, what you were looking for? And I was like, no, it's all new, and I didn't get to see it, and he's like, well, what are you looking for? And I was like, lock, key, front door kind of a thing, you know. He's like, oh, that's in the display case in the back. And I was like, wow. Um, so that was pretty cool. This is the lock, the same exact lock. Um, it's in the American Lock Museum. It's, it's actually, I'm borrowing it right now, so it's actually with me. But on the face of it, you can see Robinson's patent. You have the same thing on the lock in the back. I personally wanted to see what was inside the lock, so I took it apart to investigate it. Um, it's, a, it's a double key and a double key lock so it's not uh, something you can pick and that was the whole patent was that it was not a pickable lock so 1828 another aside that's when they started investigating the idea of putting a railroad from providence to boston and continuing you know all across the country or the east coast at that point you see the first evidence of the train as it would go through the Attleboro Precinct, which is East Attleboro, or the Second Congregational Church. And that does eventually make it there, but not this path. That brings me to the 1832 map. Uh, you can't really look at the 1832 map without looking at the 1831 sketch that Capron produced in order to produce the 1832 map, because you've got so many differences between the two maps and in, in the 31 map, he's using full names, perhaps, and abbreviated names in the second iteration of it in 32. So between the two, you get a lot more information than you would with just using the 32 map. You see the very beginnings of what becomes known as the Boston Turnpike. Um, so they're straightening the old post road. So we're now going to bypass the First Congregational Church. It's no longer going to be on this major axis. It becomes the secondary road. Um, and uh, you see below in the rectangle, it's Newport to Boston Road. And it's 435 rods from Pawtucket Line to Barrows Tavern. So that's 435 times 16 and a half feet. Um, and you can start to pick up measurements like that. You see Barrows Tavern here, and you see the first congregational there, and most likely that's the Universalist Society right next to it. And then if you go into East Attleboro, which is now the city of Attleboro, uh, you'll see the East Precinct Meeting House, but that's the second congregational as we know it. You'll see different names written out in different ways 
um, and they change back and forth between the two maps so you can really pick up a lot of information that way. And this is the 32 map with the same names, the same marks that I put on it, but you'll see that he then changes it to the second congregational meeting house versus the East Precinct. This was the fire barn museum map that I originally was going to work with. Then I got Marion's map. Then I started to like do the graphics on that and bringing that map into a very clean printable map that would have been what they had in 1832 to work from versus a map that's got all the staining and the tannins and the time. So we had to clean it all up and then we made it look a little bit older so it looked more proper, I guess is the word. The red line is the new Boston Turnpike. The blue line is the old post road. And you can see how they cut this whole section out, which is, that's the church right there. Uh, the first congregational church, I said, should be clear. These are the original proposed rail lines. Um, neither one of these got built, thankfully, because they had it running right next to South Attleboro on the south side of the streets. And I can only imagine what that would have done to that section of town. And this was what they called the uh, supposed line between the precincts. So it was the East Precinct and the West Precinct. Obed Robinson was so important a character in Attleboro history that they actually identified his house outside of the Attleboro border, which I found very interesting, right? The only house outside of the, the line of the town. And there's the South Attleboro. You can see the proposed path of the train coming through. And I think that we're very lucky that it didn't get destroyed by this rail line coming through like that. And another thing I really enjoy doing is I enjoy taking these old maps and then overlaying them on Google to see just how close they were. And it's remarkable what they did as surveying compared to what we do with satellites today. We have the 1850 map of Attleboro. Um, that's a very interesting map. It also includes a lot of names and a lot of information for our history. Um, it's probably going to be the next map that I work on. Again, you can see one versus the old post. So Boston Turnpike and the old post road. The railroad got straightened up a lot. Uh, instead of adding all these curves, they gave it one clean chevron going through the town of Attleboro. Uh, these are all the towns within the township of Attleboro with the first congregational church marked. Here you have Robinsonville. It's clearly defined here on the 1850 map. And this little circle here is the Robinson Cemetery. And if anybody is interested in the Robinson Cemetery, I've done a lot of research on that, and I've printed some copies of my research, which I'll have in the back. And then that brings me to the point where, because we're working on Sadler and Sadler Mill and the Sadler family, um, everyone knows the Sadlers as arriving in South Attleboro in 1863, but that's not true at all. His father was here earlier than that. And um, this is from the 1850 map. And Thomas Dakin Sadler is already owning all these different properties. And he did a lot of real estate. So there's a lot of stuff in the Taunton deeds that I can use to trace that family. Um, but George Sadler, who starts the Sadler Mill, is starting it in 1863 because his father gives him the property and the building to work in. 1887 is when the Attleboro split, and this is a map that I found showing the proposed line of division. And that brings me to the last map, which was technically the first map that we worked on, which is the 1891 map. And so we borrowed that from the Industrial Museum. And we scanned it, cleaned it up, and I was mostly interested in that map because out of that map I extracted the South Attleboro portion and that was what I was going to use to base our application for a historic district, which I'm getting tortured for by the State Historical Commission, but that's another whole story. Um, but this is what we rep reproduced from that map to try and work on uh, the historic district, which I will continue to work on. And that's the end. <laughs>